Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome uh, to the next FPNA Board Connect meeting. This is our meeting number three. Thank you so for thank you so much for joining us. We have participants from more than fifty countries around the globe today. Uh, Today's meeting uh, is the second meeting on the subject of zero-based budgeting or zero-based FPNA. My name is Larissa Malnichuk uh, and I'm a CEO and founder of FPNA Trends Group and International FPNA Board. Uh, and I'm so happy to be here. And let me remind you about um, uh, FPNA Board Connect mission, why we started this project. So for the last Four years I traveled the world. I, I, I opened FPNA uh, board chapters in 27 cities, 16 countries uh, on four continents. Incredible experience, hundreds of case studies, thousands of senior finance practitioners, uh, a lot of uh, commitment, a lot of interesting discussions. So now we can travel uh, the world. Uh, physically, but we can travel uh, digitally. So this is the opportunity for us to pause and to start share the experience with our uh, global uh, FPNA community. So uh, those are the upcoming FPNA Board Connect sessions. So we will have a stop in Paris, in Seattle and San Francisco, in Kuala Lumpur, in New York, and the subject will be predictive analytics, business partnering, analytical transformation and driver-based planning. Uh, we already had two meetings, and this is our meeting number three. Let me remind you about the agenda. So last time uh, we started to look at general uh, zero-based budgeting experience in corporations. And today we are going to look at very practical experience, a business case study. So we will start with a quick introduction and uh, remind us uh, where, uh, what are the latest trends and developments in zero-based budgeting and zero-based FPNA. And then we will have a case study that will be presented by Lucas Herbert, who is FPNA director at IC Mia at Takeda. Uh, Lucas is a member of our Dubai FPNA board. Also, when he was based in uh, Tokyo, uh, he was a member of our Tokyo FPNA board. Uh, we will have opportunity uh, to have Q&A session and uh, all together it will take us around 40 minutes. So this is the time for introduction. Uh, we are very happy to have Lucas Herbert here who is FPNA director at IC Mia at Takeda. And Lucas has very international background. So for the first time we met uh, a little bit more than two years ago in Tokyo, where Lucas was uh, responsible for uh, Asian operations. And uh, the last time uh, in Dubai we met there because Lucas uh, was transferred with his company to Dubai. Uh, he is responsible for many countries, for more than 20 countries uh, for, for his company. And obviously, uh, FPNA transformation using zero-based technologies. Uh, this is the area of interest for Lucas. Uh, Lucas, we are so happy uh, to have you here. Welcome uh, to the FPNA Board Connect meeting. Hi, Lucas. Yeah, hello, Larissa. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm I'm very happy to be here and uh, joining you. Thank you so much. A uh, very quick introduction of my background, uh, Larissa Melnichuk. Uh, I'm based uh, just outside of London uh, at the moment at my home office in Berkshire, Reading. Uh, I'm qualified British accountant, Chartered Institute of Management Accountants, and I always worked in FPNA before I started my own company. And at the moment, I'm managing uh, FPNA Trends Group, and I'm traveling the world with international FPNA board. I uh, hope to start traveling again in September, but at the moment, we're enjoying our digital journey. Uh, a little bit about housekeeping. So the meeting will be for 40 minutes. We know how busy you are, so we will try to be uh, really very practical uh, and uh, 40 minutes will be enough. Uh, opportunity for us uh, to connect and to have your feedback through two polling questions. Uh, at the end, we will have one Q&A session. And of course, there will be opportunity for survey uh, after the webinar is closed in order to get uh, your response, your feedback, how we can improve. So the second meeting about zero-based budgeting. Uh, what was uh, interesting from the previous meeting, uh, 
the, the polling question revealed that more than 60% of you think that uh, zero-based budgeting and zero-based um, FP&A approach uh, is going to be even much more popular uh, after the COVID-19 situation. So just a quick reminder, and I really like this quote. Uh, this is quote on zero-based budgeting. <laughs> I, I, I really like it. It could be uh, really applied uh, for modern FP&A. From Albert Einstein, uh, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. I think it's wonderfully uh, redefined uh, the concept of zero-based budgeting when we forget about the past and we are thinking about the future. We're starting from scratch. We are starting from zero-base. Uh, I redefined a little bit um, the evolution of zero-based budgeting. Uh, at the last meeting, uh, a lot of interesting questions from uh, our community. And some of you mentioned how we can uh, call uh, the zero-based approach, zero-based budgeting, if the uh, word budgeting is not evolutionary, if this is the static and uh, really outdated word. So uh, I would like uh, to call this zero-based FP&A, value creation. So obviously, um, a traditional budgeting, 100 years old, uh, traditional zero-based budgeting is 50 years old. But with everything what is happening in our environment, uh, we are really looking at the past uh, a little bit carefully. And this is a great opportunity for us to start a zero-based FP&A exercise. So lo to look not only uh, at uh, your cost and expense basis from zero-based point of view, but also uh, to look at any line of your profit and loss account and also balance sheet from the point of view of zero-based. Uh, so this is the timing for the first polling question. Uh, before we start with Luca's presentation, we really would like to have some feedback from you. Uh, I'm opening this question right now. I'm launching it and you can start voting. Uh, so you have to choose uh, only, one, uh, only one answer. So do you currently use zero-based budgeting or zero-based FP&A technique in your organization? Yes, we use. Yes, we use uh, zero-based budgeting or zero-based FP&A. No, we don't use them at all, but plan to deploy in the future. Or no, we don't use them and don't plan to, uh, to deploy in the future. So I can see that uh, almost 50% of you voted. Um, let us wait a little bit. Um, more than 60. Uh, wait a little bit and I'm about to close uh, the poll. So I'm closing the poll and I'm sharing the results on the screen. So you can see that, uh, interesting, uh, the majority of you, more than 51% uh, said that no, we don't use them, but we plan to deploy in the, deploy in the future, definitely. This is a good timing. Uh, some of you uh, already started to use uh, the wider uh, concept, uh, the value concept of zero-based uh, planning, zero-based FP&A, so you apply um, zero-based principles, not only to cost basis, but also to other lines of your um, planning process, to other lines of profit and loss account, balance sheet and cash flow. Uh, and 15% of you, yes, they use the classical zero-based budgeting. But 23% said, no, we um, don't plan to use this in the future. But who knows, maybe after this meeting, uh, after the presentation and case study, you will change your mind. Uh, Lucas, uh, I would like to ask you to comment on this uh, very quickly. Um, yeah, indeed, uh, I think it's a very interesting result and um, uh, I th the re result also reflects a little bit uh, the purpose of the session. I mean, I hope that um, with the experiences uh, that I'm going to uh, talk about, uh, you'll feel a bit more reassured or uh, prepared um, for, you know, uh, maybe a future engagement into zero-based budgeting. And um, for those of you who already use it, uh, I'd be interested, of course, for your questions at the end, if you agree and if you had uh, similar uh, experiences. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lucas. Uh, I'm going to hide the results. And now this is a great starting point for your presentation. So Lucas Herbert, FP&A Director, IC MIA at Takeda. Uh, and Lucas is going to share his experience on zero-based budgeting and actually very practical experience. Lucas, you're welcome and the microphone is yours. 
Very good. Thank you very much. And uh, again, I'm very happy to be here. Um, uh, Larissa, if we can go to the next slide. Thank you very much. Good. So I would like um, to talk about a zero-based budgeting uh, in an initiative that we have done at uh, Takeda um, a few years back. Um, and I call it a full-scale application because it was, I believe, at that time probably one, if not the biggest uh, project that we have been running at uh, Takeda. Um, it received a lot of attention and a lot of efforts went into that. And um, so I would quickly like to walk you through um, so what we did um, and also maybe some, some feedback from my side and, and some considerations. Yeah. Um, we went through the uh, project with external support and, and I just borrowed from uh, the external partner. I think the key uh, slide uh, or the, the key graph um, for for the approach, yeah. And I believe actually it's, it's very important uh, that you follow uh, such a structured approach and that you really start um, the zero-based budgeting from the beginning with the right setup. Um, if you decide to go kind of all in to make this a, a global uh, project for the entire uh, company, um, it is a very disruptive um, approach, right? Like the Einstein uh, quote uh, showed uh, or said that um, that Larissa was showing just previously, it's really um, kind of encouraging your organization to think out of the box and uh, try completely new ways of budgeting. Yeah, so it's also that you need a lot of top level endorsement and support throughout the entire project. But of course, from the beginning, yeah? And it's going to be, I believe, it's going to be very difficult for you if you do it, uh, if you try it very small or maybe with a small sample group only um, <clears throat> uh, and, and then try to extend. Um, so let me walk you through the, uh, the different uh, steps and uh, give you just a few uh, keywords um, uh, about what is happening there. So at the beginning, we looked, uh, we did the visibility. So that means we extract a few million um, data set uh, from the, our SAPs or ERP systems for analysis. Yeah, um, and maybe I should mention our scope for the project was on uh, GNA spend, so on our on uh, OPEX and everything that was not customer facing. So our target was clearly we wanted to improve our efficiency without risking um, kind of like any impact on on our uh, top line. Yeah. Um, so we focused on GNA, all kind of GNA expenses. If it is travel, if it is events, if it's any kind of subscriptions, and so on. If it's your fleet, uh, yeah, fleet and the company cars, facilities. So sometimes you can already see from that scope some of those are very big items, other items are very granular. Um, so a very complex um, um, activity. So we retrieved for the. You know, the uh, last 12 months we took as a sample, we retrieved all the information from, from SAP, several million data sets, and we started to analyze them. Um, you know, there were, what we found also were a lot of inconsistencies in the bookings, the way uh, items were recorded. We spent a significant amount of time and effort to clean this up. And then we clustered uh, this into, into so-called cost packages. Yeah, a cost package could, for, for example, be travel. And um, and then with, and here I think uh, our external partner played a, a key role. Um, and I mean, it, I don't want to now, uh, you know, I can only vouch for the one we selected, but I mean, uh, I don't want to make any promotions for them. So please, uh, you know, whenever you do that, select whoever you feel comfortable with, and I guess they will follow similar approaches. What we then did is we did a benchmarking. We did a benchmarking within the company, but we also did a benchmarking to our peers and also to, company, uh, to companies in other industries. Yeah, Because when you talk about travel, when you talk about events, there is not really a reason why pharma should spend uh, different amounts than uh, consumer goods. Yeah, And we recognized, uh, and then we could actually um, really see in which areas were we good, and in which areas were we uh, not so good. And then you can do a very targeted approach where you want to save, uh, where you want to attack and where you want to save money. And you can say, okay, we want to come from the fourth quartile of spend in cost package ABC 
to second quartile within this year and maybe over the next three or four years we want to be first quartile we want to be best yeah and then we provided uh, you know we defined category ownerships and um you know so th these are kind of like uh, you know uh, cost package leads that would then focus on travel they would talk with all the business units that we had across the company about their travel spend they would provide guidances they would provide uh, best practice yeah and so on a lot of these also uh, that you recognize very quickly is that you have very often very uh, heterogenic uh, guidelines yeah about when can you maybe travel business class um, you know how many days you should book in advance those are all details but they will actually accumulate in sum up to uh, quite a lot of money and then we went into zero based budgeting and um, I think one of the big achievements here was that we were able to set up a planning a, a proper planning system within a few months only I think we only had around two months to make this uh, to have the system up and running and open for our planning and submission uh, so you can probably imagine it was quite a, an intensive period and in those in this uh, dedicated system we really were um, requesting a lot of details so very detailed driver based schedules so for your planning for your travel you needed to say i'm planning to fly from tokyo to zurich three times a year for those events or i'm flying to to chicago to these events and um, on, on, for example, on events, you needed to say, I have this number of people, I do it in in-house or I do it in a hotel. Um, this is my budget per person. And this will give you great, great insights, right? Uh, the idea behind this is that it's not a finance exercise purely, but that you engage with your procurement and then procurement goes back to your vendors and says, look, we're gonna have, we know we're gonna have 1500 flights from Zurich to Tokyo or out of Tokyo we're going to have those this number of international flights yeah and we're going to have this and this events in that and that location uh, so you really really can bargain completely different prices yeah and then we um from the but it's actually maybe a step ahead so when we received all the input then those uh, cost package owners the category owners uh, they went back and they said, okay, look, with what has been submitted now, we're not moving from fourth quartile to second quartile. So what can we change? And actually, that's kind of the uh, really nice thing around this budgeting is, so I was in that time, I was at the first time in the situation that I needed to budget my own cost centers. And it made it very easy because I said, okay, I need to, I have those kind of activities. I have these trips and I just keyed it in, just like you would, book a trip for your vacation you say okay i want to go to the fijis and then you know your vacation you know you go to i don't know opodo or whatever and it gives you the price for the trip a similar thing we did for our business the the cost package tool was exactly set up like that you could say okay i'm gonna go five times to um maybe to dubai or to zurich or wherever and it would give you the price and then you could have the conversation with your manager and he would say okay I don't think you should go there three times, only go twice. And then I took a, one flight out and it would automatically recalculate my budget. So it made it actually very easy and also very focused discussion rather than saying, oh, you have to, um, you have to uh, cut 20%, yeah? And after that, you just go into control and monitoring. That's when you then match your actuals against your plan. And you don't do this on a, you know, on a trip level or event level, you see, okay, with your bottom-up planning, you came to this amount, and now in your actuals, are you hitting this amount? And if you exceed, maybe then you ask a question, why? Okay, because I did three more trips, or I had that event, and blah, 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 yeah? So this was the approach, and it was hugely successful um, in the first year of, of implementation. So now quickly, what are the key items, yeah? Um, so I think I covered the approach, uh, and also, I think the feedback is that it will really provide you a completely new insights on your OPEX. Tons of things you were never aware of. That one country spends five times the money per person on an event like another one, right? 
and then you can really very focused you can manage your pnl you can you can tell one country you're doing too much on on your events are way too expensive watch there but with the rest i'm completely fine and you can tell others here on on your fleet your fleet is um too expensive please have a look at that and and some of those items are of course more strategic it doesn't mean that right away in the first year you can change that your fleet you have probably several year long contracts the same on on facilities um you see you're gonna have you're gonna have great surprises how much you're gonna pay per square meters uh, across your company yeah and all these you have suddenly you have visibility and then you can agree where do you want to sit do you always want to be in a prime location or do you want to be in a not so prime location a bit uh, more in the suburbs yeah and then you know over the course of several years you can make a strategy where you want to optimize your spend yeah and we had a lot of um since this project was so big at Takeda we had a lot of interviews with companies that do that year over year and they actually uh, confirmed that even after doing this for four or five years it still provides savings because you'll always find something where either within your company someone is above the benchmark or about the average where he can optimize or again with external benchmarks where you see okay here we've a bit lost we lost a bit of track and we want to um we want to uh, catch up yeah so my Feedback overall is extremely positive, but there are considerations I think that you need to take. It's extremely disruptive. It's so much work to fill in those, uh, you know, to do the analysis, also to argue with your business units and tell them, you, you know, look, that's what you spend in this cost package. It's way more than everybody else. And, you know, to get their buy-in to improve. So it's something really where you need to manage your stakeholders you need to communicate from the beginning yeah and and see always stress the value adding that you're getting out of that my key sentence was always we try to eliminate inefficiencies once we've done that the company is still going to be a great place to work you know we're not taking away the water from your fridge or the free coffee or whatever it is or or you know we even we also didn't change for example our policy around business class so after a certain uh, distance, you are still allowed to fly business class, yeah? But on other things, we became more strict, yeah? Then the next thing is, when you go into those driver-based schedules, um, you quickly, you very quickly go too far. Oh, another column, another information, and that's gonna be great. Make sure you use all the information that you're asking, that you afterwards, can say, okay, I asked you for this information, the hotel nights, in, uh, events inside the company, outside the company, because now I gave this to procurement and they provided this saving. So always tie it back to the activities that follow uh, once the, your colleagues have submitted all the input. And uh, again, uh, I jumped the point, I recognize, so focus on key items. You know, when you do your visibility, see where do we have the biggest gap and where can we save the most money don't do it on your entire pnl people are going to get crazy focus on travel is an amazing thing events is an amazing thing where you can save huge amounts of money easily facilities is something that's very easy to collect and where then you can develop a plan for the next four or five years yeah so really make sure you have a quick turnaround on that yeah and then going forward make sure it's an integrated part of how you report your financials if you have one person sitting somewhere in a dark corner and he's working on your set bb uh, kpis like okay oh uh, you know every uh, the the, the um, uh, compliance to our travel policy has improved we saved a million or we saved two million if if this is a niche of your reporting people are not going to see the benefit of all that work Make it part of your monthly reporting. Show this is our OPEX. Overall, our, um, our profitability increased. OPEX contributed X, Y, that to, the, uh, to this improvement. Yeah, that's, that's extremely important. If you keep it separate, I think it's, it's, it's very unlikely uh, to be successful over a long time.
Um, now, on, so this is really for a big scale application as we did it. Now, maybe if we move to the next slide to a, a smaller scale um, application. And I think now we are all in the same situation. With COVID, we have we are completely uh, thrown into the cold water, right? So in our case, for example, Takeda closes the year end of March. So we just started our new fiscal year. We just finished our uh, our planning a, a few months back, and now you know, kind of, it feels like many of our assumptions are obsolete. Many events we we need we will we are going to do. Um, we are going to do virtual. A lot of our sales force cannot work the same way they, they did before, so a lot of things need to go virtual. All the interactions within the company, but also with our uh, customers and clients, and with the patients, of course, since we are a pharma company, has changed drastically. On OPEX, similar on our top line, right? Um, it is, uh, as a pharma company, uh, also, we are we are of course uh, impacted by by uh, you know access to hospitals and and those kind of things, um, but they are also great opportunities. Yeah. So I think when you look at your PNL, my take right now is there are as many opportunities at risk as as there are risks. Yeah. So what we are you know thinking about now is really we are doing like a very focused on ICMA level, uh, a focused review and a quick review of um, how we're going to do our fiscal year 20. We're going to focus on our promotional activities because here we see the biggest impact from COVID because we are restricted on traveling, we are restricted on you know uh, meetings, on events with customer and clients, patients. So we need to rethink uh, or we need to understand how our fiscal year is actually going to look like. Yeah. So we have now very focused discussions about those specific uh, spends and cost packages and we believe in a few weeks only we will be able uh, to to have a, uh, to have a feedback and actually have done a complete revision of of our of our uh, plan of the fiscal year. Yeah, um, a lot of this is around phasing exactly. And again, for me, uh, I did in in Japan actually I was a lot of a lot involved into into finance systems and processes. It's always important that whatever you throw out, I think, to your users, to your, you know, your finance community, make sure it ties back to your system. It, ref it can be reflected in your system. Um, if you make those kind of exercises and approaches, you keep it parallel, it's not integrated, you need to reconcile if numbers tie, it's an Excel file that you need to consolidate. It's always gonna be hard. Always make sure you have a stable foundation uh, where you can build on. Yeah, so overall, uh, we had very great um, experiences on the big scale. Uh, you can look on the Takeda homepage on the official communications what we have achieved. Now, on a small scale, a quick thing for, for COVID, I put a lot of hope in that, into that as well. So, overall, very positive experiences. And um, I'm looking forward to your questions. I hope this uh, provided some of the insights that you expected. Uh, Lucas, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I already can see uh, the questions are coming from our uh, audience. But before we do this, we always like to have uh, more feedback from you. And we have another polling question that I'm about to launch for everyone. If you can start uh, voting now. So I'm launching uh, this polling question. And please, can you start voting right now? Uh, in your view, what is the biggest benefit of zero-based budgeting or zero-based FP&A process? And select one of the following. Uh, the first one, it removes fat from the budget. It helps with fl flexible planning process. It helps to move away from traditional budgeting culture. Uh, or I don't know. So please, if you can uh, vote. I can see uh, that more than 60% of people are voted, um, more than 65, closer to 70, and I'm closing the polling question right now. And I'm going to share the results with you uh, and with Lucas as well. So this is the result. Lucas, what do you think? Is it surprising? Is it something um, you also experienced before? What, what is your, your, your first speak? You know, what is uh, the biggest benefit for you, first of all? 
Um, so I would have been uh, leaning to the second or third answer. I think uh, the flexibility that you gain through the transparency and through, uh, to, you know, through the um, yeah, through the transparency to really take uh, very focused decisions on where to save and where to invest is a huge opportunity that that I see in in the entire process. But yes, it is of course also the first answer I can I can fully support. Um, you know, it is really about that. It's it, for me, zero based budgeting is not about penalizing or 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 making um, you know uh, taking away unnecessary spend from the company. It is or no, sorry, taking away uh, things that you know we all like and we all want. It's about exactly taking away unnecessary spend money that we basically we don't get the return from. Yeah, so I can buy into all um, of the three, and maybe also in the fourth one. I'm sure I do not know. <laughs> I do not know everything about ZBB and all the benefits. So there's always a, a certain uncertainty uh, included as well. Uh, Absolutely, this is the learning process for us. So I'm hiding the results, uh, and um, we are going to conclusions before we start our. Uh, Q&A session and you can uh, actually, um, just a moment before we start Q&A session, you can use your uh, text box uh, to um, to print, uh, to, to, to type your question. Uh, after the first meeting, I received uh, a lot of questions and also our presenter, Paul, uh, received a lot of questions about uh, practical steps in implementation of zero-based budgeting or zero-based FP&A uh, approach and I just uh, consolidated uh, all the knowledge my own experience the experience of FPNA board members the experience of the case studies that we dip uh, down during the meetings uh, this is the 10 step approach 10 steps uh, it doesn't mean that you have to do them uh, one after another one uh, there could be some parallels some steps uh, before or after but those are important considerations and Lucas they are very much in line uh, with your steps as well Obviously, it's all starting from purpose. Is it your zero-based budgeting to remove fat from your uh, cost expenses by basis, the traditional one? Or is it uh, the more advanced and forward-looking FP&A point of view? Uh, of course, sponsorship from the top is important because uh, the, the whole organization is involved. And then, as Lucas mentioned, priorities are very, very important. So uh, to define those independent packages that will mostly benefit from zero-based budgeting or zero-based uh, planning approach. Uh, interviews, this is where in FPNA we can exercise our business partnering skills. It's very important, I know this from my own experience, to come uh, to the meetings prepared with your uh, analytical approach, uh, with some uh, assumptions and with some um, knowledge to share with your uh, stakeholders and of course everything about this uh, a new age uh, zero based planning approach it's about key drivers so driver-based planning uh, this is the basis for so many uh, wonderful techniques in fpna and it could be one of the approaches that can help us uh, zero based budgeting zero based planning exercise uh, through interviews of course collaboration is important uh, define routine uh, whether it's one-off exercise whether it's day-to-day -day exercise different companies use it differently uh, for some companies it could be only one-off exercise for some uh, it could be dna in their uh, management culture and of course uh, make sure that you have visibility and account accountability uh, use technology for this because obviously excel will create a lot of um, inefficiencies monitor and adjust uh, automate all the warnings automate uh, all the outliners uh, that you can and of course it's all about flexible planning process it's all about um, uh, the value creation and, uh, and of course there will be a lot of change management so this is a very quick uh, consolidation this is a very quick conclusion and i think this is a great timing now for q a session so i'm launch i'm launching q a session and we already have uh, quite a few questions um lucas are you ready for the questions sure so the first one uh, is about um the benchmarking. How did your organization complete the benchmark research? Was it only for controllable expenses? Yeah, very good question. Thank you. So we, um, as I mentioned before, we focused on um, 
we focused on uh, all kind of uh, GNA cost, and um, we had, uh, I think, I would need to lie, I don't remember, I think we had uh, defined around uh, 20 cost packages or so that we were looking at. And uh, this included, you know, the, the you know, events uh, and activity related, but also like facility related expenses. Um, and then uh, the benchmarking data we received uh, through, through external partner, right? So this is something we typically, you, you typically cannot access. And we also, um, they were mixing, of course, different uh, players of, of either the same industry or other industries. So we could not confirm we could not see one to one. Okay, this is I don't know Pfizer. This is whoever, right? So it was anonymized, but we had a very nice view where you could say, okay, first quartile, second, third, or fourth quartile in that specific category. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for your answer. Uh, another question: uh, How you have defined cost drivers for ZBB, and what are the challenges in defining cost drivers for zero-based budgeting? Yeah. So again, we are uh, we were we went from this uh, benchmarking. You can imagine this uh, very easily, right? You have the first column. You see the spend that you are having in that category, and then you see, let's say, your fourth quartile. And so then you can make a and uh, then it, it the same slide shows you first quartile maybe spends uh, uh, per uh, on average uh, amount X Y Z. So you could make the calculation if we're coming to second quartile, we're gonna maybe save several uh, million of dollars. So then you know, okay, let's focus on one cost package. Then in this cost package, the cost drivers um, you can identify by thinking about what makes up the cost in such a cost pile. Yeah, uh, if you think about um, an event, for example, what are your cost drivers? It is first: is it internal? Is it external? The number of the participants, uh, the location, right? What is the location where you do it? Do you do it in Dubai or do you do it in in Kiev? Will give you completely different um, amounts, of course. How often do you do this specific event? Yeah. Those kind of things, and we all put this in 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 schedules with with formulas. So, <clears throat> in some cases, the drivers are kind of a, what we call P times Q, yeah. So price times quantity, as in that case of of event, yeah, and the, the travel, for example. And in others, it was uh, the drivers were more like uh, drop downs, where you say on consultants, for example, or contingent labor, where you say, okay. Uh, you have contingent labor starting uh, here to there. Who is your partner? Okay, do we have one partner we are using globally for to uh, to engage with contingent labor, or does every country have a own partner? And then how much do we, on average, spend for a resource? Uh, and depending on the grading for per month, yeah. And then again, procurement can engage uh, on those drivers and can challenge those and then can try to. Uh, uh, make it better. So you're working on two fronts. You then, once you have the drivers, you either work on reducing the price, that is what procurement does, or the quantity. Yeah. Do you need to have one contingent labor, or three or five? Yeah. One event, ten events. Um, so those are the discussions that you're having then. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, two more questions. Uh, the first one is uh, how difficult is it to convince uh, business department owners about zero-based budgeting? Uh, they normally don't agree uh, on reduction in costs. This is the first question. And the next one, how do you best mitigate the increase uh, of time invested in ZBB approach? Yeah. So two questions. Both, both very, very good questions. The first question, how hard it is, extremely hard, uh, horrible. This is your key success factor, as I said. If you don't have the support from the top line, uh, from C we had CEO, CFO driving the project. So you can see we really, otherwise it would not have worked. Uh, because every budget owner is gonna tell you that he knows exactly what he spends his money for and that there is no better or more efficient way doing it. So. One is you really need the support from the senior management. If there's any doubt about uh, the benefit of this, uh, you, you're really going to be um, in big trouble. The second thing is you need to convince with facts. If you're showing, of course, after the visibility, if you're showing one business owner that he spends three times the money than the other one, 
on the same activity, right? You you have you have a point where you can start arguing. I also recommend actually involving the business into the visibility that they recognize their numbers, and then it's very it's becoming clearer. And the last last thing that is important for uh, to to convince is the speed. If you start your exercise in January and you haven't showed shown any results in in September, October, November uh, of all this analysis, then it's going to be very very difficult. It's kind of like a lame duck. It, you need to be all in, get external help, get internal help, get the guys who get really things done, who work, who stay late, who are result oriented, to turn this around in a short time, and then you'll get also then you're convinced by results. And to answer the, the second question, um, which was about the increase of work. So the initial first time is a lot of work. So again, you need to have good arguments. You need to say, I need each of this information for that. And afterwards, you need to prove that you actually use the information. Still, my impression is, and that's also the feedback that we receive from the external interviews, the more you get used to it, the easier it actually gets. And as I said, if you are new into budgeting, it actually gets very easy because as a new budget owner, I didn't have any clue how much I should budget for a flight or for travel or for events, for education. And it was like, a, like an online booking tool. So I, I right away spit out my numbers and um, and there was my budget, super easy. And the next year I could carry that forward. I was checking each of those flights, do I need it, do I not need it? Yeah, and then I confirmed, I updated, I took some things out, I put other things in, but I could still argue every penny that was in my on my cost center. So I think it's getting easier. You know, technology helps becoming more integrated. It's looking fancier. So I think after the first time, uh, it's getting better. So maybe start with three, four cost packages that will bring you really the biggest benefit that people also appreciate the outcome of their work and then you can extend. You can also then drop a package and include another package. Yeah, where you see, where when you analyze and you find other packages where you make uh, the, back, the, the biggest impact. Uh, Lucas, thank you so much. Uh, the timing now for the last question. Um, we have more questions and unfortunately don't have opportunity to answer all of them. But then there uh, will be opportunity to connect with Lucas uh, and uh, we will try to answer uh, if we can. Uh, so the last question is about um, how do you measure the success of your zero-based budgeting exercise? Do you have a set, set of KPIs? to help to make sure that the approach implementation is on track? Yeah, yeah. very good. Uh, also a very good question. So, and to all the other questions, I'm really happy to spend uh, some time. Uh, Larissa will forward them to me. I will answer all of them and she will distribute them. So um, we will make sure you get all, we get all of them answered. About the measurement, yes, we do have KPIs. And a lot of KPIs go hand in hand with global guidelines. Yeah, policies and guidelines. That's something you also want to consider. And then you set targets on the adherence on this. So, for example, um, using your company credit card, using uh, company hotels, uh, booking two weeks or so in advance, uh, never fly business class unless you're entitled to. This will actually bring a lot of, of benefits. On meetings, right? Engage only with preferred suppliers have meetings under a certain number of people in-house, not allowed external unless you get approval from a relatively senior member. Um, yeah, And this, of course, through your planning, um, you can already do assumptions how much saving this will bring. And you can also say, we want to reduce traveling, we want to increase uh, usage of Webex or other uh, online tools, and you can track this, right? You can track the number of meetings that you had and are they going down? Are the virtual meetings increasing? And um, that's all possible to track. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lucas. Uh, thank you so much for your great presentation and uh, for answering the questions. 
Uh, we're a little bit over our time, uh, and this is the time for us uh, to move to the next step and to close the webinar. Just a quick reminder to all of you that we continue our FPNA Boat Connect uh, journey, and the next stops will be in Paris, Seattle, San Francisco, Kuala Lumpur, New York, and London, and those wonderful uh, subjects as well. And also, we will have uh, the full webinar uh, on the subject of engaging intelligent FPNA within uncertainty. So please stay with us and. You you will receive uh, the presentation uh, and you will have opportunity uh, to register so all the links will be there uh, and finally i would like uh, to say once again thank you so much to lucas lucas thank you so much for your great support thank you for sharing your wonderful experience with us thank you so much for answering all the questions thank you so much lucas and finally You're very welcome. I would Yes, you're very yeah. welcome, and and I hope uh, everyone who attended also got the expected benefit from it. Yeah, and uh, looking forward to hearing more questions. Absolutely, yeah, and um, I would like to say thank you so much uh, to all attendees, to our global FPNA community. Thank you for staying with us. Thank you for supporting us, and please remember that. All together, we are moving FPNA to the next level. So, any experience, any case studies, uh, any um, innovation in FPNA, please share with us. Uh, so, um, when we close the meeting now, you will have opportunity um, to uh, give us your feedback. But we will send you the recording of the webinar, and we will send you the presentation as well. Looking forward to meet you uh, at the end of this month for the next uh, FPNA. Uh, both connect stop. Thank you and all the best. Please stay safe and healthy. All the best.